we're going to start today by talking about something, a slide I'm going to show you. And if, what I want you to do is pretend you've never seen the movie that this slide relates to, OK? Because I'm going to ask a question around it. Here we go. All right. Taking a look at this, again, you've never seen the movie. Who survives? So thinking about that, normally, you'd end up saying, OK, could be T-Rex, could be King Kong. It would never be Naomi Watts in the middle. And the thing is, though, is that she indeed, of course, is the one that survived, right? And so when we're talking about uh, what we're doing today and building predictive organizations, and what I call harmony and analytics, which is the, uh, the thought of this talk, it's important to keep in mind, I think, this quote by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And he's talking about uh, music. And in this way, this touches on forms of communication we don't often really think about or take for granted. And I think this influences our perspectives when we think about shaping organizations and our communications with each other. That's a big part of the Sherlock syndrome, where essentially, you're taking a look at how Sherlock looks at the world. And before, when Sherlock was written, it was a pretty fantastical thing, right? Sherlock could stand up here where I am and could take a look at this audience and form all of these fantastic analyses, right? And then form deductions based off of this and explain it to everybody, and everybody's blown away. But what's interesting, what was fantastical when that was written, is that nowadays, that's actually really becoming possible. And it's becoming possible through integration with technologies. We're going to talk about that. So in doing that, I think it's important to consider organizational harmony. So just take a moment and ask yourself what that is. Think to yourself, what would be organizational harmony, whether it be within your educational center, where you work, where you would like to work, or in your day-to-day -day lives? And when thinking about that, I'd like to think of communicating in that way as far as using a metaphor of music. And so when shaping organizations, oftentimes I think about uh, the harmony of an orchestra and that everybody is uh, intercepting in different parts. Folks have to rely on each other. They all come in in different ways. And another way of thinking about this and getting to this line of thinking is uh, with the brain. Now, a colleague of mine, Ryan McLeod, he talked about the brain a bit and formed um, an analogy with it that I want to talk about here that I found that fits very well. So essentially, think about um, your kids, right? And then think about how much they're learning and then everything that's firing off within those first few years, right? Everything's come together at an incredible pace. It's pretty astonishing. And then if you take a look at everything that comes out of it, where you have your personality and speech and reasoning and so forth, I mean, these things are all coming together in ways that, if you think about it, very much are like a connected symphony, or essentially different ways, making the musical character the individual. Now, if you take a look at the way that the internet has evolved, created by Al Gore, of course, uh, was, then what you end up seeing here is something very similar, which is fascinating. And it's continuing to evolve at an exponential pace. The amount of data being brought into this medium um, every day, every minute is now extraordinary. I mean, the last few years, more than the entire, more than human history in recorded history, right? And so this brings in a concept that I call social consumer knowledge management, or in a way that the globe over is becoming so tied together, so interconnected, and the way that we integrate and search and so forth, these type of aspects are extraordinary, but are something that we actually now take for granted. I mean, we just take for granted that we can touch base with anybody, anywhere, and in fact, our social media needs demand it. So in a way, when you then step back and say, so how are we going to take a look at business in this type of an environment, you're moving from the economics of scarcity to the economics of ubiquity, or essentially the economics of everything. Because now, more and more information, it's available everywhere at any time. And so how do we deal with that? How do we shape organizations that way? And an aspect of this that I like to point out are what I call social predictive analytic platforms. Or essentially, you take a look at Google and Facebook, and you think about what's their business model? What makes them operate? How do they actually end up uh, bringing in revenue by bringing us this social connected knowledge management uh, experience that I'm describing? How do they actually bring reality to something like the Sherlock syndrome? This idea where you can type in whatever you want and what you're coming back, it's going to be very targeted and forward. And so 
with that in mind, of course, their model, of course, is ad revenue, right? And by going after ad revenue, how do they make that work? Well, the way they make that work is after uh, behavioral patterns, tracking behavioral patterns, tracking how we're doing, what we're doing. Facebook does the same thing. Essentially tracking our preferences and getting better and better at not only helping to predict our behavior, but in some ways to shape our behavior. And there's different ways to think about this. A gentleman by Edward Snowden, I think that most have heard about this fellow, um, he, it's something I call the Snowden effect that's related to this, where he brought forward revelations that were startling the globe over, right? But in some ways, how different are those revelations from those companies that I just pointed out earlier? And not in a big brother scary way necessarily, but more in just a way of, well, we're actually, all of our actions as we integrate more and more online in this phenomenon, it's be we're becoming more tracked and interconnected, a byproduct of that that we can apply towards business is saying, how can we then better engage with our customers, with our clients? In education, how can we better educate and touch those around us in ways that we haven't thought of before? And so taking the big brother aspect out of that, also consider when folks talked about the privacy that was lost when looking at uh, Snowden's revelations, then ask yourself within this room, how many actually changed their behavior based off of Snowden's revelations? How many actually stopped using a lot of these key tools that he'd actually pointed out were uh, essentially being mined and so forth. It's interesting as far as what touches human behavior and that's something that comes into play we talk further about how we're shaping organizations. So a big part of this happening behind the scenes is big data. And again, I mean big data, we hear about it all the time. Um, it's, it's, it's talked out in many different ways. But in my point of view, big data, it's a way, again, of using this me musical metaphor of anticipating each other's moves. Again, you have all of this data, and what's happening today to make that Sherlock syndrome work is we're able to actually filter through it and be able to get a defined analysis that's extremely relevant for what we're looking for. That's a key aspect, that's a key difference that's revolutionizing the business that we see it uh, today. And so an as a point of this in, in uh, action is uh, Tinder. Now, my fiance, she, she talked with me about this before I was actually looking at, when I was writing the book, I was thinking about, okay, I'm gonna talk about big data and speed dating. And she was saying, Eric, what are you talking about, man? Nobody speed dates anymore. Everybody's on Tinder. And I had no idea what Tinder was, go figure. So I had to go and find out. And taking a look at Tinder, and then seeing how it works and how it pulls from social media platforms and how it's actually built to not only read the behavior that we want, but actually target our preferences in a way where we go back. If you just think back five years, that's extraordinary. What's that we're able to do today? And this is only becoming more exponentially relevant towards our day to day. So think about something as simple as that that we might take for granted and then the enormous complexity behind it. And then think about how this is again when we apply this towards organizations, how we'd want to shape them, how we want to move forward. And one of the main things that these, all of these aspects come together, that bring together, is time. So, for example, I, uh, I work at a, at a law firm, Director of Knowledge, Technology, Innovation there, right? And one of the key aspects, market disruptions facing the legal industry, is time, the billable hour. When you take a look at how you interact with others using social consumer technology or search, like I just showed you, or you think about how you're interconnected or how you're teaching within an educational system or how you want to reshape organizations, be in touch with the trends happening within it, what, what does that end up doing? What it ends up, well, all we're talking about is the natural efficiencies that we're creating within this new environment and time is at the heart of it. So taking a look at that and understanding it, we're able to actually put something in play for uh, organizational change and I call it lenses of opportunity, different ways of looking at it. And so when you're looking at doing any kind of organizational change, there are certainly challenges. As we all know in corporate culture, there are many. And in doing that, it's all about managing perception. So take a moment now and think, how much can you actually manage the perception of uh, your online profile, so to speak, or your professional presence in ways that we haven't before? Now we can log on to Twitter, or we can write blogs, or we can, 
we can create a lot of different interactivity just personally for ourselves that we've never been able to really do before. And in organizations, it's actually very similar how we can be innovative in taking those steps. One of the realities within organizations is uh, essentially this, uh, the, the sociopathic element to some folks up in the higher echelons of business. I mean, it's been case study, people talk about it. It's something where you're gonna have to deal with difficult personalities from time to time. And so this quote from Sherlock, I think, uh, the BBC show version, hits that really well as far as the high functioning sociopath. And what's interesting with that is that taking all these elements into play, how can we then start to work to build that connected symphony that I was talking about earlier? If we're gonna affect organizational change and we're gonna go ahead and build these uh, predictive organizations, how do we start bringing all of this together? And so one of the thing I think that's important is to really understand and think about the realities of human nature. And so in this case with Douglas Adams, when he's talking about dolphins and their perspective and then human beings, of course, and uh, their perspectives and how the two coincide, you can actually see how is when we work with individuals, when we're communicating, you can never really be sure if we're gonna be on the same page or not. There's a lot of back and forth and byplay. And one of the ways of taking a look at this that we came up with is essentially taking a look at, okay, a lot of times folks can think about in ways, I wouldn't say antiquated thinking, but in ways they're familiar with. I call it two-dimensional thinking. And how many here have read the book Flatland or familiar with it? Okay. And so within this concept, you have an entire race of two-dimensional objects. Okay. But then at some point, this two-dimensional medium is disrupted by the presence of a three-dimensional object. And at some point during the book, the two-dimensional object actually gets up out of the two dimensions and sees itself within a three-dimensional environment and thinks, oh my gosh, this is something I haven't looked at or experienced before. This is the type of disruption I think that we're facing now when we're taking a look at evolving predictive analytics. And so well, I call this spherical analytics. And the way of explaining this, you take a two-dimensional workflow standard, but then you bend it upon itself, so you have shorter distances between points, shorter, dis shorter communication paths. Essentially, it's symbolic of trying to think in a way that is outside what we normally take for granted. This creates new process and workflow modeling and evolving analytics, but it, what the main thing it does is you have this continual symphonic movement through the harmonic orchestra. And so keeping that in mind, as we take a look at this, one of the fundamental elements to make this happen within an organization is trust. Whether it's a community or an organization, an executive team, the folks we're trying to communicate with, this is a key aspect in play. And again, it's something that we have to really think about because I think oftentimes you then have to take a step back and look at oneself and say, if I'm going to affect change in a way, what is it about myself that I can change first? and that can help us take a look at others, talk with others. One of the aspects that comes from this is something that I call prejudicial thinking. Um, not in a racial tense in this case, but more in a way that we'll have our own idea on how things should work. And sometimes we don't realize the channel that we put ourselves in when looking at that. And so it, again, it's taking away to step back because what it does is it leads to static steps. And uh, uh, in the book, talk about essentially how static steps stagnate. And this idea that if you continue with this, it's the end of an organization that falls in that. And especially in today's accelerating environment that we're talking about, this social medium that's taking place, you can't really do that. One has to continue to evolve. Again, it comes back to that first slide about this Darwinian disruption, Darwinian evolution. We have to continually move forward. A key example of that is within the newspaper industry. And the newspaper industry, those that were able to evolve with the internet succeeded. Those, those that didn't, didn't. It's something that happens continually with us and it begins with ourselves. And a way that it begins is with reinvention and through reinvention. A way of continually redefining ourselves. And although Hamlet gives a perspective on it here, when looking at an organization, I think it's also important to take a look at the fact that you really need to have data to work with, to start with. Again, getting back to this big data, this predictive analytics aspect shaping the predictive organizations. What's your starting point? How do you get there? And when thinking about an organization in this way of any kind, I think it's very helpful and useful to think about posture, positioning, and time. And so in a way, this, was, this is for more of a martial perspective or from a dance perspective. But in a way, think about the organization that you're involved with. 
one that you want to help shape, coordinate, move with, right? Think of your customer base, client base, those that you're interacting with, right? And then, how do you end up wanting to affect change? So the posture, essentially, in this case, is, have you actually, is, the, is the thought leadership taking place within the organization? Is there an analysis formed on a lot of these concepts that I'm talking about? Is it, is it there, therefore ready for the next one positioning to essentially say, okay, we have this thought leadership base, we've done research, we've started to organize some fundamental change within our organizations, and so with that in mind, how do we then end up acting? When do we act? The last one, of course, is timing, because when a market disruption ends up taking place, if you've done a lot of this background and so forth, you can move immediately. You can take action, which is really important. And the timing sometimes seems like, when folks are looking at it, that, look, I mean, it's, it's an immediate thing, but it's all about the preparation with the posture and positioning that makes it possible. And so part of doing that, when taking a look at business process expertise, is to take a look at what you can do well and understanding lessons learned. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about just a quick story about something I did that was not well, that I completely failed at, actually. It was with the current law firm that I'm with. And we were uh, rolling out Google for Business, and I wanted to roll out Google Plus as an internal social media interface, right, for folks to interact with. And the way that I went about it was a classical essentially Lean Six Sigma style of building champions and those around you, which seemed to be a good idea because in corporate culture that's been a standard winning practice. But when looking back on it, it was, it was ludicrously flawed because who does Google Plus compete with? Well, in the consumer market, it competes with Facebook. And now when you look at how Facebook rolled out, did they follow any traditional corporate path as far as process uh, innovation and organization? Or was it built in a way to go viral, where that's actually within the predictive nature and the behavioral tracking and shaping aspects of it? And it's the latter. And so within our organization, it wasn't until we looked at this and understood this that we were able to actually say, OK, we can't manipulate this forward. We have to let it, we have to let it go forward naturally. We have to let it evolve. This is part of essentially moving forward with the harmony of process. And so as we get down to the close of what we're talking about here, I think it's important then when you look at all the data involved and what's driving these social analytics platforms, it's that step beyond logic that's important. That's what makes the harmony analytics and building the predictive organization possible. That's essentially what makes Einstein's point here about um, intuition and what's necessary and something that we have to keep in mind possible. And also what Martin Luther King takes a look at here when he's talking about um, essentially uh, the same kind of a things, but look how far back in history that he was aware of some of these challenges we're going to take. When you're looking at technology and integrating it with humans and human behavior, what's important and what's not? And the final thought I'll leave you with here today is that when thinking about all of this and applying it towards whatever your pursuit is, again, whether it's business, education, whether it's your day-to-day, -day, what you're trying to be successful at as you're reshaping communities, organizations of individuals, it's important to remember, I think, again, with this musical metaphor, that if you're going to start, you need to start in a moment of silence, in a moment of retro in, in, in introspection, in a way of just thinking about how to start things with a blank slate, and then you'll have a step towards innovation as your path. Thank you very much for your time today.